We decided to begin this section of the journey at Camp Nelson, near where US-27 crosses the river, and across from the mouth of Hickman Creek, the site where the first steamboat was built on the Kentucky River in 1816. On the bluffs just above the creek, a regiment of black Union artillerymen manned the battery throughout the Civil War. It's an historic spot used as a crossing point for centuries with natural cuts through the cliffs on either side of the river. From here, we plan to run one of the most beautiful sections of the river, about 56 miles down to Clifton, Joe's home, then another 13 or so miles on to Frankfurt in lock number four. Now that it's summer, the locks are operating and we'll make numbers five, six, and seven before the day is out. The first bend downriver from Camp Nelson shows you that you're deep in the Palisades region and that the scenery is going to be magnificent. Upriver, in the headwaters, down to, say, Boonesboro, vegetation grows right to the water's edge, but here it's mostly rock that meets the river. Sometimes, what appears to be the base of a 400-foot cliff suddenly drops into the river and disappears below the dark water. Dramatic as it is, this effect is a man-made creation caused by the artificial pools of the lock and dam system. These navigational pools have distorted the canyon-like qualities of the place and the gorge effect that existed before the dams were installed. In July, the original river would have been very low in this region. There would be shoals and waterfalls where canoes would have to portage and fords where you could wade all the way across. Even with the changes, there's still enough of the original landscape to imagine what a wild and beautiful river this was before the dams. From the perspective of human history, the construction of the locks and dams was necessary and beneficial. But from the perspective of natural history, the hundred plus years since the dams were completed is less than a tick on the geological clock. Given time, it's certain nature will reclaim her river. Freshwater sponge? No. What's that? Oh my God! <laughs> I wondered what these were the whole time I was growing up on the river, and I never found out until I went to college and had zoology. Is that right? <laughs> right. So have you talked to your family and friends on the river about it? Yes, yeah, since you know, since then. Uh huh. They oh just, wow! What you think? God. Have you? They just filter the water. And, Is this a plant? It's sort of a plant animal. Uh huh. Boy, they think. filter the water and get plankton. And, uh huh. Diatoms, things like that. I've never, no one's ever showed this to me before. I never knew there was such a thing. I always thought there was some type of fish eggs or something when I was uh -huh. there going up. Look at that. Let's lay them over here. I want to look up this creek a minute. Okay. I knew Joe had grown up on the river, but I had no idea of his extensive knowledge of the river's wildlife. It turns out that Joe has worked his way through college by fishing and trapping on the Kentucky River. So I was not surprised when he said he wanted to go into wildlife management as a career. 
Before we had cruised an hour, he had spotted a dozen species of wildlife and named them. The lure of the river gorge is so powerful, especially with a guide as knowledgeable as Joe, that you almost forget what's at the head of these creeks on top of the cliffs in this region. It is the Bluegrass Plateau. And up on the plateau, you're hardly aware there's a river nearby. Not a clue until you work your way through a dense tree line to the edge of a rock outcropping. Then you see it, the deep gorge and green ribbon of water below, virtually inaccessible except for a few places where creeks have cut their way through the cliffs. It is this topographical feature that has kept much of the Kentucky River free of development. As deep inside the past and canyon itself as you feel, and however far back in time you may imagine yourself, the sudden appearance of a bridge always yanks you forcefully back into present time. When I took my first canoe trip on the Kentucky River 30 years ago, there were no interstate bridges whatever in the 100 miles between Valley View and Frankfort. But High Bridge was there in the late 50s and well before. It's a primary landmark that has been carrying rail traffic across the Kentucky River Gorge since 1876, when it was the highest bridge on the continent across a navigable stream. That claim was broken long ago. From its higher vantage, you can see where the Dix River flows into the Kentucky, just upstream of the bridge. This was a major staging point for the flatboat trade in the early 19th century. Just below the bridge is Shaker Landing, where the excursion boat Dixie Bell now ties up. During the flatboat and steamboat eras, the landing was the shipping point for the thriving Shaker community of Pleasant Hill, located a mile and a half away on land above the cliffs. This particular Shaker commune prospered to the point of criticism by other Shakers because of its link with the river and its ability to trade goods with the outside world as far away as New Orleans. The handsomely restored village that exists today at Pleasant Hill is a true historic treasure for the state of Kentucky. As we cruised slowly up Clear Creek, our final diversion of the day before reaching Joe's home at Clifton, my thought was that people like Joe, who actually live on the river and experience it as part of their daily lives, are the river's true citizens and best friends. To live by its edge, subjected to its force, to gain part of one's livelihood from it, places one in an authentic living relationship to the river that oh, commuters can like myself out. can never know. Joe and his neighbors who have lived for years by the river have a practical and sensory knowledge of the world the rest of us occasional visitors can only envy. More than they realize, people who live in the towns away from the river owe a great deal to the folks who live by the water's edge and treat it as they would their own home because it is their home. Clifton Boat Dock and the beginning of our final 13 miles for this section of the river. For these last few miles, we've hitched a ride with Charles and Alice Hobson of Frankfurt. They've been boating on the Kentucky River for more than 30 years. Okay. Turn line. This part of the river, between locks five and four, is known as the Frankfurt Pool. 
It's in this pool you'll find the most boat traffic of any other section of the river. Here you see just how many different kinds of floating craft people bring to the Kentucky River. From small plastic crafts, to pontoons, to houseboats, to speedboats propelled by 100 horsepower engines, sometimes nearly blowing people in smaller boats out of the water. It's just a personal observation, but it sometimes seems to me that the more powerful the motor, the less regard the boater has for other people or for the river itself. In any case, there certainly is a different feeling here in this pool than in any other part of the river we've been on so far. It represents a big change from the days when Charles Hobson was growing up in Frankfurt. In those days, only two or three people in town had a powerboat, and uh, you were fortunate if you knew someone that had a canoe. But of course, now we have a great increase in traffic, uh, pleasure boat traffic. We used to have, up till 10 years ago, a little commercial traffic. So the river at that time, from the time the locks were built, say, in the 1840s, until 10 years ago, had some commercial traffic on it, but a decreasing amount. Now it's entirely uh, recreational use. But when you consider that the government has spent money for TVA lakes and other recreational facilities, national parks, we have here in the Kentucky River 14 distinct pools, 14 separate rec recreational areas. Therefore, we think that there's some justification for spending a little money to keep it. Plus the fact that half a million people get their water supply from the Kentucky River, right? including Lexington, Frankfort, Lawrenceburg, Nicholsville. Anybody can get a pipe over here to this river. They like to tap into it. But I think that for everyone, maybe in a different way, the river does represent freedom and the opportunity to express themselves in whatever activity they enjoy, be it fishing, water skiing, nature study, canoeing. And when you add all these together, then you get the sum total of what the river means to central Kentucky and to the people who live in this area. Within a few hours of leaving Clifton, we arrive at Frankfort, the state capital, and the only full-fledged city located directly on the Kentucky River. Indeed, it was the river's importance as a transportation artery that caused the capital to be placed here at all. Many 19th century politicians, including Henry Clay, came to and from the seat of state government via steam packet. Most of the law graphs from the mountains ultimately found their way to mills here in Frankfurt. Even as late as World War II, large amounts of cargo reached Frankfurt by river. But mainly for Frankfurt citizens, as for most other people, the river is a place to play. Certainly I've enjoyed my summertime outing in the Frankfurt pool, different as it is from any other section upstream, and different also from the river that lies below lock number four. But my travels downstream will have to wait till next fall.